In the last video, we covered how the Grant administration had pulled a fast one to initiate a war to subdue the Sioux in northern Cheyenne in order to gain control of the Black Hills. That war would begin in February 1876. In overall command of the military campaign was General Philip Sheridan, who commanded the military division of the Missouri. He had his headquarters in Chicago, with a geographic responsibility spanning from the Mississippi to the Rockies and the Gulf of Mexico to Canada. Sheridan's area was divided into four and sometimes five departments. The two departments responsible for the upcoming war were the Dakota, commanded by Brigadier General Alfred Terry in St. Paul, Minnesota, and the Platte, commanded by Brigadier General George Crook in Omaha, Nebraska. Based on his experience in the Southern Plains in the late 1860s and the early 1870s, Sheridan and the officers of his command made several critical assumptions. One, they believed the Indians would not stand against organized forces. In any situation where U.S. forces met Indians, no matter the numbers, the Indians would run. Two, Indians would never seek battle with U.S. troops unless the soldiers were in proximity to their village. Three, officers were convinced that even the meager opposition ordinarily offered by the Indians would be significantly reduced in the harsh Northern Plains winter when the Indians were struggling to survive. Sheridan's orders specified winter operations, but the instructions to the two department commanders identified no overall commander for the operation, nor did the orders spell out coordinating instructions between the two. Sheridan's own words betray the hands-off approach he took to operations in the field. Quote, General Terry was further informed that the operation of himself and General Crook would be made without concert, as the Indian villages are movable and no objective point could be fixed upon, but that if they should come to any understanding about concerted movements, there would be no objection at division headquarters. Unquote. Sheridan's disregard for coordination between his separate columns indicates his contempt for the fighting capabilities of the Sioux. It was a contempt that would lead to ineffective combat operations throughout the winter and well into the summer of 1876. General Terry ordered his subordinate commanding the District of Montana, Colonel John Gibbon, to gather his scattered detachments and begin a march from the west. Terry himself would command a column moving from the east. Each of these forces was to follow the Yellowstone River until they united. Sheridan issued orders to General Crook to form his own column and march from the south. Crook was the only commander to put together a winter column and it marched out from Fort Fetterman on 1 March 1876. Crook was essentially an observer with Colonel John Reynolds of the 3rd Cavalry Regiment in command of the column. Reynolds had organized the column into six combat battalions with 10 cavalry companies, five each from the 2nd and 3rd regiments, two infantry companies, and 62 civilian packers. These units, plus Crook's staff, the guides, reporters, total just under 900 men. Crook, a master of efficient and effective pack trains, ever since leading campaigns against the Apache, had his column well prepared for its winter excursion. General Crook was uh, fond of saying, the worse it gets, the better. Always hunt Indians in bad weather. However, Crook's initial movements did not go well. On the second night's encampment, Indian raiders stampeded the livestock herd, depriving the troops of their only source of fresh meat. On 5 March, the Indians boldly staged another raid against the soldiers' camp, attempting to stampede the cavalry horses and pack mules. Now no longer just an observer, Crook intervened in the operation and on the morning of 7 March, ordered the infantry battalion and the trains to make a great show of marching to the abandoned Fort Reno. At the same time, the cavalry battalions, with supplies for only 15 days, would hide that day and resume the march that evening. The ruse worked, and the 10 cavalry companies evaded the Indian scouts and roamed unnoticed for the next 10 days. However, Crook could not find any fresh sign of the Indians as he moved north along the Tongue River. He finally accepted the advice of the scout, Frank Gruard, who had lived among the Lakota for about eight years. I mean, he had even been a close friend of Sitting Bull. Gruard stated emphatically that the Indians would likely be sheltered in the Powder River country. True to his word, Gruard found signs of a village just southwest of present-day 
brought us Montana. With this new information, Crook detached Reynolds with six of the 10 cavalry companies, totaling 15 officers and 359 men, with orders to attack the village. Reynolds' strike force moved out at 5 p.m. on the 16th of March, following an Indian trail, and soon stumbled into a snowstorm. Gruard, often on his hands and knees, took the lead and skillfully led the column to within six miles of the Powder River. The column halted around 4 a.m., and the snow was replaced by clear skies and brutal sub-zero temperatures. Around dawn, Gruard returned to the column and informed Reynolds he had found the suspected village along the Powder River and estimated it contained about 100 lodges. If you're enjoying the content, be sure to like and subscribe. Like some nervous cadet at ROTC summer camp, Reynolds formulated a half-assed plan of attack based on a misunderstanding of the actual location of the village. His attack orders were less than clear, but he did issue a general outline of his tactical plan. Captain James Egan's company of Noyes Battalion was to approach the village and charge mounted with drawn revolvers. Meanwhile, Noyes and his remaining company would capture and drive the Indian pony herd to the south. Moore's battalion was to dismount and move to the bluffs overlooking the village to a support by fire position. Eventually, Reynolds ordered Mills to follow Moore and assist as practicable. The approach to the village took longer than expected because of the rough nature of the terrain and the actual village was a mile north of its assumed position. Noyes initiated the attack about 9 a.m. However, Moore was not yet in position. Consequently, the roughly 200 Indian warriors had time to move their families to safety, occupy the commanding bluffs, and pour fire into the cavalrymen occupying the village. Unsupported, Egan's company was in great danger of being cut off, but Mill's battalion was soon able to reinforce it. When Moore's battalion belatedly entered the valley, it was added to the forces occupying the village. Well, despite being a battle-tested Civil War veteran, Reynolds was unnecessarily becoming anxious about his force. He held the village and had captured half the pony herd, but his mismanagement of the attack had turned his force into the one besieged and even put his own horses in great peril. So fearing the worst, he ordered the destruction of the Indian village and a withdrawal, which he also poorly managed, abandoning the four dead troopers and leaving one of the six wounded behind to the vengeance of the pissed off Sioux and Cheyenne. While well, nearly as puzzling and almost as egregious, Reynolds did not allow the weary, cold, and half-starved troopers to carry off captured supplies. And so around 1.30 in the afternoon, cavalry began to disengage under heavy fire and marched 20 miles to the south and made camp. The force woke up the next morning only to find that a Indian raiding party was making off with most of the captured pony herd. And to the dismay of many in his command, Reynolds did not order a detachment to try and recapture the herd. Instead, he moved the force south and linked up with Crook. And so, 26 days after its departure, Crook's force returned to Fort Fetterman, worn, weary, and defeated. Well, what about the Indians? You know, as it turns out, the village was ostensibly peaceful and was actually in the process of returning to the agency. Although their casualties were light, they were left nearly destitute and forced to find sanctuary with other villages. As they spread the word about their plight, it served to convince the Indians, whether they were roaming or on an agency, that the U.S. government was out to terminate their way of life and seize their lands. The attack on the Powder River had backfired on the army and united the Sioux and Cheyenne under the leadership of the warrior chiefs like Sitting Bull and Crazy Horse. Indeed, it is probably safe to say it sowed the seeds of Crook's and even Custer's defeats in June of 1876.